and a lecture. So Matteo, you can start now, please. Okay, welcome back. Let me just go full screen. Okay, before I start with the third section, uh, any question, comment, suggestion, complain, or anything you want to discuss? Okay, so then let's start with the third section. So in this third section, uh, I will discuss with you another uh, specific phase of matter, which takes the name of quasi-crystals, or if you like, incommensurate phases. So this is a bit less popular. So I guess at least for most of you will be some kind of new things. And uh, it was also for me just one year ago when I discovered that these kind of objects exist. And uh, I find them very interesting. So I hope you, you will enjoy uh, the surprise that I had as well. So here I put just some uh, basics, uh, let's say uh, references as always. So these are basically, uh, this is a nice uh, introductory book to the physics of quasi-crystals. And here there is a, a, a review about the excitations in quasi-crystals. And, uh, and here, this is the, the, the paper, which actually, I mean, you can recognize some of the authors, very famous, uh, that discuss basically the hydrodynamic descriptions of quasi-crystals. And this is a, a, another famous review article that discussed basically the regimes of commensuration and incommensuration. So for, for the moment, of course, all these words are meaningless to you, but I will try to explain in a while everything. Now, before going to the details, I want to explain you a bit uh, why I ended up searching for quasi-crystals or studying quasi-crystals. And this relates to uh, a very profound question that I got in the lecture yesterday, uh, which is basically we have all these, let's say, toy model, holographic toy models, and we want to understand what they are physically, right? Yesterday, for example, I got the question, okay, this linear axiom model, what is really mimicking? What, what, what kind of condensed matter feature is mimicking. And, uh, and that's exactly why I went studying quasi-crystals. So the reason is the following. As we were arguing on uh, two days ago, if you have the crystals, uh, the main excitations in the crystals are basically the phonons, right? The phonons, if you are uh, in more than one dimension, you will have basically your transverse phonons and your longitudinal phonons. So here, for simplicity in this work, we work in two dimensions. So what do you expect? It's basically one transverse phonon and one longitudinal phonon. Now, the surprise comes when you look at basically the quasi-normal mode of this holographic model in the longitudinal spectrum. So if you look at the longitudinal spectrum, here I'm picturing basically the motion of the quasi-normal mode in function of momentum in the complex plane. So let me explain a bit better. So the, the orange mode that you see here this is the typical longitudinal phonon. So the dispersion relation is nothing else than basically linear in K, the real part, and diffusive, or if you want quadratic, the imaginary part. And this is basically this kind of motion. Now, surprisingly, when you look uh, at this spectrum, you see another mode. So you see this green mode, which is diffusive. So it's perfectly diffusive. So you see it's lying on the imaginary axis. And if you check actually better its motion, it goes again quadratic. And the first question that I had is like, okay, in crystals, usually this kind of mode is not so much discussed. Actually, it's not discussed at all. So for example, on Monday, on the first lecture, I didn't discuss any diffusive mode. And the main question is, what is this mode? And of course, related to what is this mode is what actually uh, this model is, okay? So basically, this is the question that uh, let, uh, make me start thinking about these quasi-crystals. So some people, and especially in hydrodynamics, says that this is not surprising at all. This is just mass diffusion or vacancy diffusion that appear in solids. But I, I will explain it in a bit more details why this, this cannot be, at least in the holographic model that we, we see. And the reason is quite simple. The reason is that mass diffusion or vacancy diffusions are hydrodynamics mode which uh, corresponds to some conserved quantity. So for example, mass diffusion is just the diffusive mode related to the conservation of the mass. So this means that there should be a, a, a vector field, let's say a current field conserved associated to this. But in the holographic model, we don't have absolutely any conserved quantity apart from the energy and momentum. So this cannot be. Now, some important points. So before we go to try to understand what is this mode, 
uh, let me tell you what we know about this mode. So what we know about this mode is that this mode is a diffusive mode, which appears in the longitudinal channel. So it takes this form, the dispersion relation. The very funny thing is that, is that it does not come from the breaking of translations, okay? It comes, and it was proved explicitly first in this paper, that it comes from the spontaneous symmetry breaking of the global internal symmetry. So remember, when we discuss uh, these models, uh, we were discussing that not only we're breaking translations spontaneously, but we're breaking also this global shift spontaneously. And one of the things that we were discussing already, and I, I remember some of the questions that were very legitimate, it's what is the role of this thing, right? Is this thing a real symmetry? Is this thing something that, for example, in, in the table, uh, it's appearing or it's just some redundancy of the description? It's something that we put to make the model simple or it has a physical meaning. So that's the question around. The other funny thing, which is related, is that it's proven that it comes from the spontaneous symmetry breaking of global symmetry. So this is a Golston boson, but it's diffusive. And this is quite funny, right? Because that goes back to the beginning where we were discussing the, the Noether theorem and the Golston theorem. So the Golston theorem for symmetries, which are space-time and in dissipative system can be quite funny. So for example, usually you never heard about the Golston boson, which is diffusive. And that also captured quite a lot my attention. It's like, what is this? How can I understand the Golston mode, which is diffusive? Now, other considerations, uh, just to add everything we know before we start speculating. So notice that in our models, translations are not broken to a discrete subgroup. So this is different from a periodic order solid. So in a periodic solid, there is a unit cell. The system is obviously, obviously periodic up to the lattice spacing. And in these models, we don't have anything like that, right? So for example, if you, if you think about this axiom model, phi i equal xi, it's obviously not periodic. These, I already said, so this mode does not come from the conservation of any local U1 current, okay? So it's totally different, for example, from the charge diffusion or from the shear diffusion that we discussed yesterday, right? Shear diffusion just comes from the conservation of momentum. Charge diffusion just comes from the conservation of the U1 charge. This is different. Importantly, uh, and this was proven by Andrade and Crick in 2015, there are no commensurability effects. So this is a very, let's say, uh, condensed matter way of saying that basically the system is not periodic, has no preferred periodicities. And there is also another funny thing, which is most of these systems seems metastable. And this we discussed a bit at the beginning in the first lecture. So the stability of the system is a bit tricky and not understood yet. Now, this is what we knew, okay? So this is where we start. This is all we know about these holographic models. And then let, let's start thinking. So if, if you think about it, so in the first lecture, we discussed basically periodic crystals, right? So this is the simplest uh, examples. This is just a square lattice, for example, which with some lattice spacing. And in the in the second lecture, we were discussing how, for example, glasses look like. So glasses looks like something like this. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm pointing, but you you don't see any pointer, right? Okay. So glasses look something like this. So this is what is called also amorphous system. So you can see that there is no preferred shape. It's completely disordered structure. Now, the question is, is there something in between, between this structure and this structure? And the answer is yes. So the answer is that is exactly what is a quasi-crystal. So what is a quasi-crystal? A quasi-crystal is a structure which has long range order. So translations are broken, but there's no periodicity. Okay, so you can see the difference here. Here, if you shift by a discrete translation, you will get exactly the same picture. In this kind of things, you want, okay? And uh, these structures are actually real. They were discovered and people got Nobel Prize for this. And this goes also back to a question that I, I think I got yesterday or the day before, if a, a crystal can break translations but retain periodicity. So a periodic crystal like this cannot, okay? So this crystal here is clearly not rotational invariant, but quasi-crystals can be at least invariant under discrete rotation. So for example, if you sit here and you do rotations of, let's say, this angle, you will get exactly the same picture, okay? So examples of these quasi-crystals are what they're called Penrose stylings and incommensurate charge density waves. And this is 
very linked to the holographic model and the, the phase diagram of the Cooper set we were discussing. So I will tell you in a moment what are these two things more explicitly. Now, how we see the quasi crystals, right? So what do we see? So in a real crystals, uh, how do we see the lattice structure? So the lattice structure, we see it doing basically scattering experiment and checking what their peaks. Okay, so the broad peaks are just basically a, a realization or a visualization of the structure of the crystal, right? So in a crystal, you have a certain object, let's say the density, the mass density or the charge density. And this charge density can be decomposed, right? In this Bragg decomposition in, and in terms of a vector, which is called like the, the fundamental vector if you want the, the, the unit vector. And this unit vector basically determines the, the lattice structure, right? So this is the reciprocal space, if you like. And this vector can be seen just by doing this experiment. So you can see here, for example, you do an experiment of scattering experiment and you really see the peaks. So you see that structure. This is the structure in complex space in the momentum space. Now in a quasi crystals, you can see immediately, and this is the proof that this system is actually periodic. So for example, here there is a periodicity of whatever this angle is. And sorry, uh, rotational invariance, but this system is clearly not periodic. So if you shift it, it's, it's clearly not the same. And the, the funny thing is that, uh, and this will, will come back, is that for a, an order crystal, so imagine to have a crystal in D dimensions, what you need to locate one point is basically uh, n d number, right? So you need a vector. For crystals, which are not periodic, you need actually more numbers. So this is a bit explanation. So basically, this vector can be decomposed in a base. And for order crystal, this is enough. So you need just the number of fundamental vector, which equal the number of physical dimensions. For a quasi crystal, it's not true. And I will show you in a while why. So there are some, you see, there is some kind of extra dynamics here. And this is where we are going. So before, yeah, just to, to have, you know, like a, a visualization, these, uh, these kind of quasi crystal structures appear in a lot of uh, architectural and uh, artistic, uh, uh, let's say, realizations, uh, especially in the Arab uh, architecture. So here you can see, for example, uh, one case. And uh, it's also quite, uh, you can find it a lot if you, if you pay attention when you go around on the tilings on the floors. So sometimes in bathrooms or in kitchen, etc., you will see tilings which looks exactly the same. Now let's go back to, the, to our, uh, our initial point. So let's start with a two-dimensional crystals because just because it's simple. And let's say that this is a cubic crystal, okay? So in general, uh, for example, so to locate a point, I just need to define basically two vectors, right, which constitute the base for my two-dimensional space. In this case, my vectors are A1 and A2, orthogonal and independent. And then every point, so for example, this point is just given in terms of two numbers, which are just the coefficients of the composition, of the linear composition of these two vectors, right? I'm saying very simple thing, this is just linear algebra, if you like. So any point in the crystal is just defined by two numbers. And if you are in three dimension, you need three numbers. And uh, now if you have a quasi crystals and one example of quasi crystal is for example, starting modulate is this kind of lattice. This is not true anymore. And to locate one point, you need more. So you need either more vectors. So you need more than A1 and A2 or you can say this is just a choice of gauge, if you like, that you use the same number of vector, but in addition, you use basically a phase. And the phase is very, is picture here, is basically the phase of this modulation. So you see in this picture, what I'm doing here is I'm taking a crystals like here, but I'm modulating the position of the atoms with a cosine function, with a certain phase, okay? So in order to describe this, I need the two point that basically describe my original lattice plus the phase of the modulation. Okay, so this is very important. Now, and this leads to something extremely important, which is the difference between a periodic crystal and an aperiodic crystal. So in uh, aperiodic crystals, like the one we discussed or quasi crystal, there is a new hydrodynamic low energy excitations. Okay, this excitation is called phason and it diffuses. 
So here you can see some experimental proof of this. So for example, let's check this plot. But this plot show you the relaxation time in function of Q square, okay? And therefore the, the, the slope here is basically the diffusion constant. So you can see that these points lies quite well on a line, which means that basically the dispersion relation of this mode, remember the, the relaxation time is the inverse of the imaginary part of the quasi-normal mode. It follows basically exactly this kind of flow. And this is another, for example, experiment. And then these guys, actually it's pretty funny. If you go at higher momenta, so you can see these momenta are, 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 are pretty low. So if you go at higher momenta, then you will see that it starts propagate, okay? And the question is, how can we explain this? And is this related somehow with what we see in these holographic models? Now, in order to understand a bit better what the hell is this phasen, there is a formalism which is very fascinating, which is called the superspace formalism. Let me try to understand it, at least visually. So let's take a crystal, a hoarder crystal like this one. Like in this case, it's a two-dimensional square, square lattice with distance A. So the lattice spacing is A. And let's cut it. Let's cut this two-dimensional space with a line. Now, if I cut this two-dimensional space with a line, what's angle is rational, and I project the closest point of the 2D lattice to the 1D line, what I would get is basically another periodic structure, nothing fancy. But now, if I cut this two-dimensional space with a angle here, which is not rational, imagine some square root, then when I project this point on the line, what I would get is not a periodic structure. So this is very important. That is actually a mathematical theorem. So the mathematical theorem says that every structure which is not periodic can be always seen as a periodic structure in more dimensions cutted at an irrational angle. Okay, so this is a mathematical theorem with proof and everything. And this is very nice because it tells you, it tells you already one thing which is very important. So as you can see now, if you, let's focus on our aperiodic structure here. And yes, exactly. So it, let's focus on this aperiodic structure here then we will have two kinds of fluctuations. So we will have the fluctuations in the real space. So basically you take this orange point and you oscillate it around. So this is nothing else than the standard forms, right? Oscillations around the equilibrium position. But there is another dynamics, which is very interesting, which is the following. In principle, I can translate, sorry, yes, I can basically shift rigidly the cut, preserving the angle. So I preserve the angle, but I shift this cut up and down. And it's easy to see that actually the free energy of the systems does not change if you do that. Okay, so this is the symmetry of the system. But let's try to think a bit better what happens when you do these things. So when you do these things in real space, you can see that actually atoms rearrange. So for example, if you shift from this line to this line, you see that this atom shifts from here, that intersects here, to these atoms here. So basically what you are doing is called phase and jumps and you are changing, you see, if you call basically the large distance L and the small distance S, you are basically flipping this. So you are doing this kind of process. You can realize immediately, and this is related also to what we discussed with liquids the other day, that if you do so, you have to jump basically a potential, right? Because you are basically exchanging atoms and exchanging atoms in a, in a, in a material cost energy, right? Because the atoms are bonded by potentials. And therefore, these kind of jumps appear only if you are at finite temperature. And this is actually the reason why when we were doing the effective field theories at the beginning, we didn't see anything like that. We didn't see any diffusive mode or anything like that. Because these modes cannot exist at zero temperature. Now, I start looking a bit around in the, in the literature. And when you, when you read all this review about this, uh, this Golson ball, uh, what you read is something like this. Mode counting argument and the Golson theorem lead to the prediction that the phase and modes are diffusive-like. The phase and shift leave the free energy unchanged, but they don't commute with the Hamiltonian of the system. So when I read this, this kind of statement, I, I was very confused and some 
somehow disappointed because there was no real explanation of why this mode is diffusive whatsoever. And you can search in a lot of literature and I didn't find anything meaningful. At least there was no explanation in terms of the symmetry, in terms of, you know, neuter theorems or why this boson is diffusive and where it comes from, et cetera. So we, we, we started with, uh, with some friends to, to try to attack this, uh, this kind of question from a formal perspective, from symmetry. So our questions were, what is diffusive mode and what it has to do with the holographic models and why it's diffusive? So before going on, I want to explain you more about uh, what is this mode and where it's found. So let me tell you first, what is a, an incommensurate structure and what, where these kind of modes come. So this was discussed in, uh, in a few talk uh, during this workshop. And uh, this is the typical form of a charge density wave. So imagine to have basically an ionic lattice with a certain structure. And then for certain reasons, we usually see these Peyer's instability, the charge density wants to form a periodic structure. So this is if you want the initial charge density, which is constant everywhere. And then you get a, a, a consign for simplicity, like a, a periodic function with a certain amplitude, a certain wave vector. But importantly, there is also phase, OK? And this phase, of course, uh, if, if, you, if you do the, the, the theory for this kind of charge density wave, you see that the free energy is invariant under this phase shift. Just because it's very simple, again, to understand why, this is a phase, so it, it appears only with, with derivative. And of course, if you shift this guy by a constant, nothing happens. And what this means, shifting this guy? Well, it means that if you have a structure like this, there are two kinds of excitation that you can do. So one excitation is exactly this shift of the phase. So basically what you are doing is you are taking your periodic structure, your charge density wave, and you are shifting it left and right, okay? And if you don't have any pinning, or if this, this charge density wave is in another, in another sense like free to shift, to slide, this does not cost anything. This is free, okay? So the free energy is invariant. And then there is, of course, another fluctuation, which is the fluctuations of the amplitude, okay? So the fluctuation of the amplitude uh, is not important, or actually the reason why it's not important too much for us is that because it's not, it's not an hydrodynamic mode. So it's a massive deformation. Is exactly like in, if you like in the in the X, right? In the X, you have one fluctuation, which is the Colson boson, and you have another one which is capped away. And that's exactly what happens, the amplitude. Yeah. Now, so what is this phase? So this phase and mode is just you have your ionic lattice with a certain structure, and then you have on top a modulated thing. So this is the, the charge density wave, if you like, and this is the ionic lattice. And what you are doing is you are pulling. This, this structure. So you can see clearly that if these two guys are not pinned together, are not linked together, there's no problem in shifting this structure, okay? And the phasen in this language, it's exactly the sliding of this spontaneous structure. So if you like, this is a more physical view of what I told you before mathematically. So this, this kind of motion corresponds to what I was telling you before in this extra dimensional space to shift this line up and down. Now, back to holography. So back to holography, we know a lot of cases, uh, and we heard talks also here, about basically the holographic spontaneous lattices, like charge density wave, right? So charge density wave, our done, well, we take our black hole, which is, let's say, a nice spherical black hole, and we make it completely homogeneous. So now the structure of this black hole is breaking translations, and uh, you, can, you can do it in a way that basically breaks translation in the periodic structure. So these are spontaneous inhomogeneous structure. Now let's analyze a bit better what we are doing on the contrary. So what we're doing is a bit different. So it is well known right now that in order to have this homogeneous model, what you have to do is you have to use some kind of global symmetry in the bulk. So there are two examples. Here I put two examples, but there are more. So the typical example is this axion-like model, right? That we discuss over and over. So here they have a symmetry, which is basically the shift symmetry of this guy which is spontaneously broken by this, this setup, okay? And then we can go discussing another very famous model that is used to break translation, which is Q lattices. So Q lattices is slightly different. So instead of breaking it with a, a profile, a scalar, which is linear in the coordinate, what you do is basically uh, you are taking a, a, a scalar field, which is now complex, and it has an amplitude, which now is 
depending on the radial coordinate. And it has basically a, a, a profile, which is like a plane wave. And these, of course, break translation. But you can see, again, that if you take this, the action for this guy to be depending only on the modulus, basically, there is a global symmetry. So there is a global U1 that allows you always to basically do a U1 transformation of this guy that is nothing else than shifting, basically, the phase here. So in a while, the dynamics of the phase here is exactly the dynamics of the scalar. On the contrary, the dynamics of this amplitude here is not included in this formulation, and it will be basically like a dilaton field. So if you want, you can understand this kind of Q lattice like an axion type dynamics, like a phase, plus a dilaton field, okay? So this global symmetry, as I already said more than once, is the reason why the geometry is homogeneous, but translations are broken. And it's the reason of all our headache, okay? So this global symmetries. Now let's see a bit better, at least in one model. So if you take this axiom model, uh, uh, we know that basically there are two time types of uh, symmetries which are spontaneously broken. One is the space-time translations, which gives rise to the phonons. So the phonons are the Golson boson associated to this symmetry. But there is another symmetry, which is basically this global shift symmetry. And as I told you before, uh, Donos and collaborator proved that actually that diffusive mode comes from this symmetry. And my claim is that basically this is nothing else than the phase. So this is not a phonon, this is the phason and it's diffusive. And the reason why also, there is also a nice analogy which relates to what I told you before, which is now we can try to think a bit of this kind of model like an extra dimensional model. So as you can see here, basically the coordinates so this index goes of course only in the real coordinate. And these are basically the shifts in the real coordinate. So let's, let's think about it, for example, a two dimensional plane and these kind of shifts right, are the, the red uh, arrow. So the red arrow is basically shifting in real space and is producing the phonons if you like. But then there is another arrow, which is more mysterious, like right? you are shifting in the internal space of the scalar. But you are totally allowed to think the internal space of the scalar like an extra internal dimension. So in a, in a way, you can think about this picture as not a two-dimensional space, but a three-dimensional space, where basically the internal shift is the shift in this extra dimension. So in a way, it's not surprising at all that the phason comes from this extra shift that you have here because it's exactly the same like in the quasi-crystal picture that I showed you before. So you have this kind of new dynamics and the new dynamics comes because you, you have this extra symmetry. So if you destroy this extra symmetry, this new mode will disappear totally. Now, excuse me, may I, may I ask questions? Of course. Oh, yes. So uh, what I'm confused now is that uh, in order to have a phason, then uh, it is very important to have incommensurate nature in our lattice. But uh, I think that uh, we can always have phase 16, uh, even if we, our, our crystal is periodic. So there should be some very important nature related to the incommensurate property. But uh, how, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand how this uh, property of incommensurate, incommensurate property is related to your phasons. Yeah, so I will describe yeah. a bit later. So the difference is the following. When you are in an incommensurate phase, yeah. basically you can shift freely the, the, the top, the, the spontaneous structure. So this phason is an hydrodynamic mode. When, when you go to the commensurate phase, so you do it from the incommensurate to commensurate, you basically lock together the two lattices. And now you cannot shift freely the lattice on top because you are anchored to the low structure. So basically this phase and mode does not disappear, but it becomes massive. So it, uh, it Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, it's kind of an optical phonon. Exactly, exactly. Right. right. Oh, so so your, your, your statement is that uh, if you have a uh, uh, mode that uh, that correspond to the phase shift, and if it is gapless, then it would be the uh, the phase on of the incommensurate lattice. Exactly. Is this your ah, okay? Yeah. That's my claim. Yeah, yeah. And okay, indeed, okay. something that well, I will go back to this point a bit in the at the end. So we will we will discuss a bit more about that. 
Okay, thank you very much. Let, 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 ask me again at the, at the end, we, we can discuss a bit more because it's a very important point, I agree. Mm, okay, thank you. So, you're welcome. So now, one, one important thing that comes to my mind also, and this is more related to, you know, uh, holography. So I also have to say something about holography. That's a very important question that I don't think it's addressed in holography. So in holography, whatever uh, review you, you get, you will read everywhere the magic sentence that local symmetries in the bulk corresponds to global symmetry in the boundary. Okay, so this is a kind of magic sentence that is written everywhere. And okay, it can be more or less explained, but nobody ever told you what happened if you put a global symmetry in the bulk. Now, why? Well, one historical reason is that if you ask this question to a string theorist, string theorists will tell you immediately that global symmetry do not exist, right? Because they violate uh, the, the principle of quantum gravity and therefore you cannot put any global symmetries here. Anyway, we know that if you do a low energy perspective, it's full of global symmetry, right? So in a way, at low energy, at least if you, if you, if you think in an effective field theory, there's no problem in having a global symmetry. Okay, the only problem is that when you embed it in quantum gravity, this symmetry must be either broken or disappear. Okay, but the question, which I think is very important, is what happens if I put the global symmetry in the bulk? And the question is, what is what does this mean at the boundary? Okay, so this is an important question that uh, uh, I'm recently studying also with uh, with the help of some mathematician to try to understand exactly what is the kind of dictionary. And, uh, and we will get back to this because when we will do the effective field theory in a moment, we will realize exactly where these kind of problems come from. And these are, okay, sorry, yes. This is also what, what I was telling you before. So now what I can do is two things. So one thing is I can put my structure to be commensurate, but I can also do another thing. So what I can do is now I put a small amount of explicit breaking, okay? So basically now this is not a fully spontaneous fracture, but for certain reasons, for example, there are impurities in the real world and the impurity uh, pin the structure, right? So what does it mean pin the structure? What it means that basically this structure becomes heavy and be gets anchored to these things. And now you can realize immediately that if you want to shift this guy, now it's anchored here. So this becomes energetically costed and what you will get immediately, what we get from these models is that this phase and mode now disappear from the aerodynamic spectrum and it becomes basically uh, dumped. So this kind of dumping for the phase and is called phase relaxation. And it's something that happened in a lot of systems, including superconductors. And it's basically the statement then the order it's getting destroyed because the phase of your condensate is basically broken. So what happens is that you have a long range order, so you have a condensate, but of course, if at a certain, phase, at a certain point, the phase of this condensate gets relaxed, you lose basically the coherence of this, of this guy and you lose completely your order. And this is seen in holography. So there is a funny thing, and this is a bit the mystery that was also discussed, that usually this relaxation comes in, uh, in crystals for, from defects. So it comes from what are called dislocations or let's say deformations of the lattice. In holography, we found the new things, which uh, as far as I know, is not discussed in any hydrodynamics or condensed matter, let's say literature, which is this phase relaxation appear when you do some explicit breaking. And more importantly, it, this is seen in a lot of different paper. I would say actually all of the paper, this phase relaxation is proportional to the explicit breaking. So here you can see, for example, in one model, you can see the dots are the value of this omega extracted numerically from the model. And this is basically a linear extrapolation to a, the, a fit to a linear function. And you see it works very well, at least a small explicit break. Okay, so this is also a question. So what, what is this phase relaxation? What is the mechanism without this thing? And the funny thing is that there is even more. There is even more because Gutero and collaboration found uh, using numerics and perturbative method that there is basically a generic relations for this phase relaxation mode. And in particular, this phase relaxation mode is proportional to the phonon pinning frequency and to the phase and diffusion constant. So let me explain you this a bit better because I think it's an important point that I want to stress. So if you don't have explicit breaking, what we said is that the phase and is diffusive. Okay, now I call this diffusion constant here psi. 
Now, on the contrary, we know also that if you add some small explicit breaking, the phonons become massive because they become pseudo Golson and they get a mass. This mass in condensed matter literature is called pinning frequency and is indicated with omega naught. So the statement is that now, if you add explicit breaking, the phason, which was diffusive, now becomes relaxing with a relaxation time, which is universally given by this formula. And this is proven in a lot of different models. And uh, the question is also why is this or where these formulas come from? So you see here, the, there are a lot of questions related to this mode. And I will show you in a while that most of them are actually connected to this global symmetry. Now, there was, okay, there, there was, uh, let's say, a lot of complaint on uh, these kind of uh, uh, phase relaxation uh, uh, results that we get. Uh, from, uh, from several people uh, that were just saying, well, you are just using some toy models. These are not real lattices, okay? You are missing a lot of real physics just because you are not considering a periodic lattice, right? Lattices are not made of what you are telling me, right? There's no scalar that goes like Xi. And probably these features that you see that are kind of uncommon are just fake, right? They just don't mean anything. They're just coming from the artifact that your model is simplified. And then we said, okay, well, okay, critic accepted. Let's go checking in homogeneous model. And then you go to your, you know, friends which are better than you with numerics, and you ask, can you do, can you prepare for me an homogeneous lattice? And of course they can. So that's what it looks like. So you can really have a model where these lattices are totally homogeneous. So these are basically similar to the models that Professor Yi Ling described uh, some days ago. So you get these modulated phases. So uh, I don't show you the details because they're not important, but the important thing is that you see now our very our modulated phases with a certain periodicity, perfectly fine. And then I said, okay, well, let's check what happened in real lattices, right? In, if, you, if you think that these are real lattices. Uh, well, hey, we Matthew, did. Yes. Excuse me, uh, which model do you consider in this so, inhomogeneous lattice? Which kind of yeah, model? So, so this is the model by Andrade and Krikun, is a dilaton, uh, a, a dilaton with a chern simon theorem. Ah, okay. so it, uh, yeah, it's the original model, if you want, of Oguri Park. Okay, so this is a model with a spontaneous symmetry breaking, or? Mm. So, so, good point. So, here you can see, uh, sorry, I didn't, I, I wasn't very precise. So, here you can mm -hmm. see you have these scalars and this gauge field, mm -hmm. and uh, both of them become spontaneously modulated. So, you can see here the mm -hmm. modulation. Uh -huh. Okay, and then what we do to, to check these explicit breaking things, we also add an explicit source in the modulation of the chemical potential. Okay, so you consider spontaneous crystallization in the presence of ionic lattice, correct? Exactly, exactly. So the blue is the ionic lattice, and the, uh -huh. the other thing is basically the spontaneous structure that crystallizes on top of it. Yes. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. So this, mm -hmm. is, yeah, this is the physics. And then what okay. we see, and hopefully these things will appear in a few weeks. So then what we do is we check the modes and we realize something, a lot of funny things. So let me uh, show you a bit uh, precisely what this poles mean, what this structure means. So here, what I'm showing you is the structure of the poles, actually the imaginary part of the pole in function of temperature. So this line here is the critical temperature where basically the instability appears. So if we are on the right side, the only thing that we have is basically a system where uh, there is uh, an ionic lattice or so some small explicit breaking and uh, something that wants to become unstable. So these poles here that you see is nothing else than the Drude pole. So this distance here, so is basically the pole due to the fact that I'm adding a small explicit breaking. And then you have other two poles that come from the instability sector. So the, the sector that wants to condense. So here you see this mode here. So this mode here is actually the mode that produces instability. So you see that the imaginary part goes to zero at the critical temperature. So this is the mode that drives the instability. On the contrary, we see that there is another mode uh, which is associated to the instability, but it's a secondary mode and is related, is actually shifted by a value, which we'll see is exactly this relaxation time. So actually these two modes are nothing else than what we were discussing before, are the amplitude mode and the phase mode. So this is the amplitude mode that produces instability, and this is the phase mode. 
that is shifted because of the explicit breaking. So if we remove the explicit breaking, what happens is that this poles goes to zero, so it becomes zero, and this poles goes overlapping with this one. Okay. And now what we see is that then when we go below TC, basically what happened is that the Drude de pole start interacting with this phasm. And what we see are two poles in the in the in the function in the current current correlation correlation function, which corresponds to the gamma, so the, the momentum relaxation and the phase relaxation. And the expressions match exactly the hydrodynamic theory by Harn or Gutero and, uh, and collaborator. Okay, so what we what we understood here it's uh, can be summarized in the following. So, what did we learn? So I'm sorry, Matteo. Well, can we go back yes. to the previous slide? Sure. Wait, what was the TC here? TC is the the yeah. critical temperature at which the the the, the model wants to become inhomogeneous. So where you oh, produce right. basically the periodic structure. Okay, so, so basically, basically what, you're, uh, what you want to do is just checking the, some universal relations with this inhomogeneous models. Yeah, Am so what we wanted to check is that basically, you know, uh, we got these features that we didn't understand well in this homogeneous mm -hmm. model, and mm -hmm. there was the doubt that these features were just an artifact of the homogeneous okay. model. I see, I see. So, and you know, so what uh, we did is we did the same Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, usually when you consider inhomogeneous models, we have some kind of bell curve, right? Then we will have some uh, thermodynamic, thermodynamically stable lines. So, are you checking that uh, universal relations on that lines? Yes, yes. So this is so this this actually I didn't say it, but mm. this is fixed. There is a momentum fix, which is the momentum at which becomes unstable. Okay. So this is basically the first mode that becomes unstable if you want in your bell curve. Mm. So when you have your bell curve, you go down in temperature. At a certain temperature, which is this temperature, you eat the bell curve at a certain momentum, and this is exactly the momentum of this mode that eats here. Okay. So this is a finite momentum, if you like. That's the okay. picture. Okay. So here, so, yeah, so excuse me. So, so here you consider the curve and the curve and the correlator. So which component had, did you consider? Okay, so in this plot, so first of all, I have to say that this is a cartoon. So the real data are still a bit ugly. So we are doing the, the real plot, but it looks exactly like this. And okay. uh, so this, this, the blue here mm -hmm. is the current current correlator. So transverse current correlator above TC. And the only thing that there is, is an hydrodynamic, is a through the pole, nothing else as expected, because the only thing we are doing above is breaking translation mm -hmm. explicitly. So, I mean, now, TD yeah. component or XS component? Your current, I mean the temporal component or special component for the no no this is the, 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 the current current it's not the charge it's the current J X. So X is a symmetry breaking direction or homogeneous direction. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a symmetry breaking. Okay, you break transition symmetry in X direction, and you can yes. see the correlator along the X direction. Yes. Okay, I see. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. So that's why we see the pole. That's why we see the pole because translations are broken in that direction. So mm -hmm. for simplicity, mm -hmm. for simplicity, we did just one D because of course it's hard. But in principle, mm -hmm. you can go to two D. Yeah. Yeah. It's sure. Sure. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. Just more complicated. But if you do isotropic, I don't think you will see anything new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just. Yeah. Okay. And the, so this is the JJ. This is exactly the black is the JJ below to see. So you see that there is an additional mode appearing. So now mm -hmm. it has two poles. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can see where this pole appears. So this pole appears from basically this instability sector, which was basically this A, Y, Phi, uh, let's say, correlators. Yes. And then so, what, what happened is that below TC, basically, because you have a condensate, these guys couple to momentum. And mm -hmm. therefore, it couples also to the current, because we are at finite charge density. And then it appears in the JJ poles. Yeah, so curiously, so um, I'm a little confused. So because here you can see the quasinov modes for this mode, correct? Mm -hmm. The quasinov yes. mode. So you know, in this very complicated and inhomogeneous background, in order to calculate the quasinov mode, you turn off all source terms, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And all modes are coupled with each other. So how to identify this mode belongs to the JJ correlator, not from the T I mean momentum or from the heat current? Yeah, good question. So uh, what we do here, it's uh, basically uh, a simplified things. 
which is the following. Mm -hmm. So instead of computing the quasi-normal mode in full glory, full momentum, full frequency, all the correlators and everything, what we are doing is the following. We do a trick, since we know the physics, actually I didn't say much, but there is a model to understand all these things. So this model is called, is, is called pattern formation theory. And uh, I don't have time to explain why, but you can explain exactly all the features that we see from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, kn we knew already that at least in, in these regimes, the modes were purely imaginary. So what we did is the following. We compute directly the correlator, so mm -hmm. the various correlators, on the imaginary axis of frequency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then we see in the correlator, at a certain point, we see the spikes. And we identify mm -hmm. that as the pole corresponding to every correlator. Oh, I see. That's basically what happened, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of okay. course, we were in interested in basically the two things. One is the current current, so the conductivity, if you like, and the other one is the modes driving the instability. Mm -hmm. Because so th this, these things below TC, as I, I will explain in the next slide, is very understood from hydrodynamics. The question is where these poles come from. Mm -hmm. Because you see, when you are above, the true pole is already there. Mm -hmm. But the, the omega pole comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's the point. And then it couples. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Okay. So it's not, no, if you like, it's, it's not that the, the pole is not there anymore. It's just that basically the, 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 the function, the residue is zero, if you like. So there's no, the, it doesn't appear mm -hmm. because it doesn't couple. The two operators do not couple. Mm -hmm. Right? So you know well, right, that when you compute quasi normal mode, depending which, which what, what thing you switch off or on, sector mm -hmm. can decouple. Mm -hmm. Right? So here is exactly what happened. So what happened here is that here you produce a condensate at finite momentum, so you couple more things. Mm -hmm. But if you are above, basically you can see that this sector is not coupled to this sector. And mm -hmm. you can understand also why, because this sector basically is the scalar sector, mm -hmm. right? Because you see this is a scalar. Mm -hmm. So if this is a scalar, it's obvious that unless you break some symmetry, or you do something strange. The scalar does not. The scalar sector does not couple to the electric conductivity sector. Yeah, are two mm -hmm. different sectors. But then, mm -hmm. when you produce a condensate, and this condensate has finite momentum, and breaks translation, then you are coupling everybody, and that's yes, what yes. happened here. So okay. below here, everybody is coupled. Mm -hmm. Above, it's not true. Yeah, yeah, that's that's reasonable. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. let me continue. So. Below this, what did we find and what did we learn? So the first thing that we learn is that below TC, the hydrodynamic spectrum of the homogeneous model and the inhomogeneous model are identical, are totally exactly the same, and they are in perfect agreement with hydrodynamics. So hydrodynamics tells you that basically the structure of the pole, if you have explicit and spontaneous breaking of translation, must be this way. And what we find is that it doesn't matter if your system is homogeneous or not, these modes, which are the hydrodynamic modes, so the low, the lowest mode, are exactly the same. So what we learn is something that somebody, you know, before already stated, especially Nicolis in his papers, that no matter if the system is inhomogeneous, at large scales, the physics is always homogeneous, which makes sense, right? Because if the inhomogeneity has a certain length scale, and you are looking at scales which are much larger than the inhomogeneities, who cares about the inhomogeneity? Right? You don't see them. There's no way yeah, to see them. Yeah. And that's exactly what we proved here, basically, that the modes are exactly the same of these homogeneous models. So in a way, you, you can say that these homogeneous models, even if they are toy model, if you want to look only at large scale, so at the hydrodynamic mode, they capture absolutely everything. There's no need to go to an homogeneous model unless you want to look at different observables. So I'm not saying, of course, that the homogeneous model are the same of the homogeneous model. I'm saying that if you consider only the dynamic spectrum, they are. Now, what do we learn more? So this is what I was saying before. So the physics of the model can be understood perfectly, as always, for a paper that was written 30 years ago. And from what is called the amplitude equation and the theory of pattern formations. So this is a very standard theory, and it's actually pretty funny. You can see it's applied to a lot of things, especially uh, um, systems that wants to spontaneously produce patterns. For example, boiling, boiling water. So you have you know, a system that at a certain point, a certain temperature wants to develop a structure, and you want to understand what happened at this transition. And you, there is a theory, and this is the theory. And this theory is adapted to our holographic model, predicts absolutely everything exactly. 
Now, the other thing is that we proved explicitly going above the sea that this omega mode can be really understood as a phase relaxation. And it can be identified also above the sea. Notice that in the axiom model, for example, this cannot be done because there's no TC. You are always sitting in the broken phase. And then there is another thing which is interesting. We checked if this relation was valid also in homogeneous, in homogeneous model, and you can see it works. So this is the phase relaxation, and this is the amplitude of the ionic lattice that break translation explicitly. And you can see that at small uh, amplitude, it, it, it follows quite well a linear slope. So this is good news. It means that that universal law is actually very universal and it's valid also for inhomogeneous model. Now, the, the things that I think it's, it's still there and it's at least I'm not satisfied is why that mode is diffusive to start with. And how can I understand this universal relation, right? There should be some kind of field theory descriptions or understanding of this, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is some simple symmetry breaking pattern. Now, the main difficulty, again, comes from the fact that this mode is totally linked to dissipation. So as I already explained at the beginning, if you go at zero temperature, you won't see this mode. It's not there. And so the, the difficulty is, is that now you have to do field theory with dissipations. So the way to do that was explained to us by these two gentlemen, Keldish and Schwinger. And the way is basically to rethink about uh, an action formalist in the, in the statistical, let's say, in, or quantum mechanical sense as the trace of the, of the density operator. And what you do is basically what is called the schwinger kaldish contour or path integral formulation. So what you do is basically you double the degrees of freedom and you write down basically the, 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 the field theory in terms of two degrees of freedom. And as you can see here, these two degrees of freedom is basically one guy is associated to a source J1 and one guy is associated to the source J2 with the dagger. So basically this guy is the guy that goes forward in time. And this guy is the guy that goes backwards in time. And then of course there are, there is, you know, this is a, a huge mathematical formalism and there are conditions that you have to put and boundary conditions, et cetera. But the important things is let, let's stay a bit on the physics because I, I cannot of course explain you this in, uh, in five minutes and um, I don't know it so well. So the point is the following. When you double, imagine you have a single scalar field and you want to do it at this, with dissipation, so a finite temperature. So what you do is you double it. So now instead of having phi 1, you have phi 1 and phi 2, where phi 2 is the copy. Now, the physical understanding is much better if you consider their combination, which is a sum, and their combination, which is a difference. So the combination, which is a sum, is called the classical field. And it is actually the expectation value of the quantum fields itself. The difference is basically encodes the thermal and quantum fluctuation. So it's the basics of dissipations. And here you see again something that we saw yesterday that in order to have dissipations, you have to somehow double your degrees of freedom. In a way, this is not so surprising if you think about the original formulation of dissipation. Usually when you have dissipation, the, the, the first thing you think is you couple your theory to some kind of thermal buff, right? So the thermal buff gives some extra degrees of freedom where you can dissipate. And these are, naively the extra degrees of freedom that you need. Now, with Michael, very recently, we, we studied how to do basically this effective field theory for quasi-crystals at finite temperature. So what you have to do with uh, kind of logic is the following. So you have to assume basically some fields which has this shift symmetry. Okay, so you have a field which has a shift symmetry and this shift symmetry has, is basically not only in the three spatial dimension, but also in the extra fourth dimension. So this is a special dimension, but don't confuse it with time. So now these are, uh, these are fields. And then what we want to do is basically we want to do our decomposition. So we know that not only we have to consider, let's say one field, but we have to consider two and make the difference. And now here there is an important thing, which is actually the most important thing. So you see that once you do the combination, Basically, the combination, which is the sum, which is the real field, is clearly not invariant under this shift. Okay, so this means that in your effective action, if you want this symmetry to be a symmetry, you cannot write a term which is phi r. Okay, this is clear because otherwise you will break this symmetry explicitly. On the contrary, the difference of the field, which incorporates dissipation, so this A means dissipation, then you see that. This is invariant under this shift. 
So this means that in defective actions, when you write down all the possible terms, you are totally allowed to write terms which are actually non-derivative in this guy. And that's what we did. So what we did here is the following. So the first term, I'm not going to discuss it much because it's a standard term, which is has nothing to do with quasi-crystal. It's just basically the, the standard coordinates and stress tensor and whatever. The second part is more interesting. And that's basically an expansion in this field. As you can see here, no phi R terms appear because otherwise I will break the symmetry. And then of course, here I, I'm not telling you the full story, but there are some rules to write down these terms. So you have to assume some, uh, some conditions. So for example, these actions has to satisfy certain condition that comes from unitarity, causality, et cetera. But this does not forbid to put terms which are actually anti-emission like this, okay? So this is the, the action. And then what you want to do is you want to see what you get, right? So what you get is very simple. Then you have to do fluctuations. So we fluctuate and the, the, the easiest way to understand basically the, 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 um, the phase and uh, dynamics is let's go to a limit for simplicity where we switch on. So we fluctuate only the phase, okay? So this is of course in the limit where basically the interaction between the phason and the phonon is small. And it's proven that actually this interaction is important, but it's important only at higher order in momentum, for example. So then we fluctuate this, uh, this guy. And, uh, and what we see, well, what we, what we do is, is something very simple. You take this action with all the details that I, I didn't write and you fluctuate it and you get an equation, right? So you get an equation for this phi four mode, which look like this. Now this equation, let's, let's look a bit at this. So here you can see that there is basically two derivatives in, in space. And here there are two derivatives of time. So if you forget this last term, what you will find out is that this mode is nothing else than a propagative mode. It's, this is basically a wave equation, right? It's nothing else than a wave equation with some coefficient that comes from that action, okay? But you can see that there is an extra term. And this extra term is linear in the time derivative. And let's go back to see what is this extra term. So this extra term, M44, is the extra term that you can put exactly because that you are at finite temperature, because you are at dissipation. So this guy encodes the dissipative things. So if you remove this guy, basically, you see that your action looks pretty much standard action, EFT, with no uh, total emission and no problem. And, and therefore, you will get basically another copy of the phonon. Right? It's like you're adding an extra dimension and an extra form, nothing else. But if you add this term, you see that the dispersion relation gets modified by this coefficient here. And now this equation, again, it's very funny. It's the same equation that we were discussing yesterday. Right? So if you solve this equation, what you find out is that at low momenta, this guy is diffusive. And at high momenta, this guy is propagating, exactly like in the fluid we were discussing yesterday. And then you can also, you see, you can also extrapolate basically from the EFT, what are these coefficients? And you can see that, for example, this coefficient here, as I was saying, is proportional to Z, is M44. So if you remove M44, you basically remove dissipation and you get another propagating mode, where this extra coefficient is basically an extra elastic term, if you like. Now, this is very interesting because if you compute actually the, the word identity for the, the J4 current, you will see that this is not conserved. So this current is not conserved and this is proportional actually to this M44. And this is again, something that I want to stress because it's very interesting. And uh, you should already ask me right now. So you told me that you wrote an EFT where the shift symmetry is a symmetry. And you find out that the word identity is broken. So what are you doing, right? What happened to the Noether theorem? Well, what happened to the Noether theorem is again what we were discussing the other day, that the Noether theorem in dissipative theory where the Lagrangian, for example, is non-hermitian must be taken very carefully. So in systems which are dissipative and non-hermitian, you can have sim systems which have a certain symmetry, but what current is not conserved. And you can see that non-conservation of the current comes in from, in, indeed from the non-emission part. And again, you can convince yourself that the argument is exactly the same. So if now you compute the Hamiltonian with this, the, the operator that produced the shift in this four direction, you will find out that basically it's just this thing. And you can easily find out that these terms is proportional to the uh, non-emission term, to the M44, okay? 
And, and this, you see, somehow is what everybody was writing in, the, in their papers. But for me, I don't know if, you know, probably they understood it, but it was not clear at all. So this, that's what they mean by that the phase and shift is a symmetry of the system, but does not commute with the Hamiltonian. And the main reason is because there is dissipation. So if you don't consider dissipation, this is not true. And this relates to something which is in general very interesting, uh, which is the existence of diffusive Gaussian mode, on, Gaussian mode in dissipative system. So in dissipative system, you can have Gaussian mode, which are actually diffusive. And uh, I refer to this nice paper. It, actually, there's a series of paper by Daka and collaborator where they discuss uh, how to interpret these modes, uh, which are diffusive. Now, the last thing that I want to tell you before concluding is I want to put uh, some more emphasis on this universal relation that we were seeing. So I want to show you that actually this mystery that came from holography is not actually a mystery. It's a very, uh, a very expected, uh, let's say, relations. So let's do the following now. Now let's uh, as introduce some explicit breaking. So in order to introduce some explicit breaking, as I was telling you before, we have to include hard terms in the action, okay? And that's exactly what we're doing here, right? So every term which is not too derivative in the, phi, in the, in the hard fields breaks the symmetries. So the X terms is related to the space-time translation. So if I put a term which is XR, it's basically breaking space-time translation. Psi is related to the phase and shift. Therefore, if I put a term which looks like this, I'm breaking the phase and shift at least. Now, if you do in general, you can see that you can write four different terms with four different coefficients, which has nothing to do with each other. But let's think a, a bit better at these holographic models. So these holographic models retains the diagonal symmetry. Remember that we are building them in a way that we are breaking the shift and the translation only to the diagonal. So if you want to do that, you cannot write an action like this, but you have to write something more constrained, which look like this. So if you write this combination, you can see that now if you do a, a translation and you counterbalance it with a shift, these terms is invariant. So basically, this diagonal symmetry imposes that these coefficients are related to each other. They are actually the same. And now let's try to see what is the dynamics of this guy. So the dynamic of this guy, let's start to, to look at the phonons. So if you look at the phonons, you will realize immediately that this is giving a mass. This is just a mass for a phonon. And this is giving a relaxation time, right? Because it's just one derivative. So if you find, if you write down the question in Fourier space, what you find out is this guy, which is what you expect from a, a phonon, which is uh, subject to a small explicit break. So you will find a pinning frequency and you will find a relaxation time, which were absent if you don't break the symmetry. And these two terms are basically exactly coming from the EFT. So this phonon now is dumped and pinned. Let's now go to the phase. So what happened to the phason? Well, what happened to the phason is that the phason before was basically these first three terms without this mass, right? But now it gets a mass, right? And it gets also an additional dumping, which is modified just this expression, but it's not very important. And very importantly, and that's the key, these terms here must be the same appearing in the phonon equation because of the diagonal symmetry, okay? So then we can just solve this equation. Okay, so we, we solve for omega, it's very simple, and you expand it at low momenta. If you expand it at low momenta, you will find that the, the mode starts with a relaxation time, relaxation rate, which looks exactly like this. This is very simple algebra from this equation. And now we have to think about it a, a bit better, what this means. Well, if we go back, uh, if we go back in the previous slide, we can see that this coefficient here was related to the diffusion of the mode. So how you see this? Well, forget about this mode and do the same exercise. And you will find that the first term here is actually diffusive and the diffusion constant is proportional to this gamma, okay? And if you plug it inside, so you rewrite this guy inside, you find out that basically this omega here is omega naught square times the diffusion constant divided V square. And then you can do an immediate comparison to the formulas that I was showing you before. And rewriting things, this is just a rewriting of various things, you find that this formula here is exactly the formula found by Blaise and collaborators in their paper. So that formula is not a mystery, it is not any surprise, it comes just from symmetries. 
So that's why also in all these models we see it. That's the only thing that we can see. As far as you are doing this symmetry breaking pattern, that's what you see. And this is nice because this is equivalent somehow to the Gelman relation for the phonon. So you can see that the phonon, which is propagating, gets a mass. And we know that this mass is proportional to the explicit break in time spontaneous. And here we know that if the mode on the contrary is diffusive, like a phason, you get basically a, a relaxation time instead of a mass, just because there is this additional term. And funny enough, recently, in the last week, I discovered that this kind of relation was implicitly already present in a condensed matter paper of the 80 or 90. So this, of course, written in a complete different language, but this was not a big surprise. Now, I more or less concluded what I wanted to say. I want just to finish with some uh, few remarks about uh, why we are discussing these things. Well, OK, for me, the, the point at least, at least where I start from is basically understanding what these holographic models are because you know I, I've been working quite a lot on these models in the last year and uh, you know we can do a lot of computations but the role and the, 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 the physical meaning it's quite mysterious still and I, I wanted to make some progress in that direction to understand actually what it is because when I understand what it is then I can understand what to apply to otherwise it's a bit difficult to you know to say to, to make statements and then of course there is a big question which is basically uh, related to you know a series of paper by Arnold, uh, Blaise, and De La Cretas, uh, etc., which is what is this? Uh, does this guy have a role actually in the real physics? So what is the role of phenomenal the phenomenological role in these diagrams? Okay, and the claim is that this guy can have a big impact on the the properties of the straight the bad metal behaviors and even maybe the superconductivity. And this appears not only in the DC conductivities, but also in the optical conductivities. And it can be understood in, this, in the following way. So we know that you have basically a regime here where you have some kind of charge density wave, but this charge density wave fluctuates. And there are quite a lot of experimental evidence that this charge density wave fluctuates. And the fluctuations of the charge density wave produce exactly this phase relaxation term, because it's just exactly what we're discussing. This charge density wave is fluctuating. And uh, and the, the idea is that these kind of fluctuations can have an imprint on this bad metal phase, which is a bit higher here, or even on this superconductive dome down here. Now, this is another topic which was or, or already discussed at the beginning, which I think is very interesting. So it, it's very interesting to understand what happened when you go from the incommensurate phase to the commensurate phase. So what does it mean commensurate phase and incommensurate phase? Well, it means that the two structures now are, so in general, the two structure, the spontaneous and the ionic structure can have completely different periodicities. So they can be completely unrelated like here. But in certain cases, and this happens, they can correlate between themselves and have the same periodicity. So this is called locked in. And these phases becomes what we say commensurate because basically the periodicity is, a ratio, the, the ratio of the periodicity is actually a, a rational number, okay? So a, a very important question which, uh, was basically uh, done at the beginning of this lecture is what happened to the phase and which are the properties of this phase transition. And even more, uh, and from the holographic point of view, of course, there are various ways of uh, understanding this. One way that I, I want to, to explore better is you know, to try to describe this transition from an EFT point of view, so from symmetries. And the second thing is, of course, you can try to understand what is this phase transition? Is this really a phase transition in which universality class and how, for example, thermodynamics or other properties behave, conductivities and things like that, and how to implement it holographically. And uh, then there are more advanced uh, topic questions, which are also discussed and uh, uh, worked out by, by some of the people present, and which is how order in general interplay with different instabilities, like for example, superconductivities, right? We know that there are a bunch of other instabilities in this material. There are pneumatic instability, the break rotations, there are pair density waves, there are magnetic instabilities. How all this order play together, right? And holography, it's by definition, uh, basically one uh, playground where these things can be studied pretty much. And, and of course, not only holography, but in general, I think the, what I try to convince you in this series of lecture is that there is a very strong interplay between holography, hydrodynamics, and EFT. 
And I think that the, the union of these three makes a very strong theoretical uh, tool to attack all these problems. So let me just conclude my, my lecture with two slides of recap of what we did. So, well, the first thing that I, I hope I, I convey to you is that phases of matter are interesting and there's a lot of cool physics and the cool physics come from very different things. So the, there are a lot of theoretical questions. There are a lot of fundamental questions. And, uh, uh, and the funny thing is that there are a lot of practical questions, right? So I find at least personally, this kind of uh, merging uh, very cool and uh, very funny to work. And the, the other important thing that I want to convey is that at the end of the day, uh, whatever we are doing, if we want to look at these low energy universal properties, everything that is governing these things are symmetries. Okay, and symmetries uh, nowadays uh, are becoming more and more sophisticated, right? We have topological symmetries. We have symmetries, for example, we saw, which do not correspond to conserved current. And uh, recently we have, for example, a lot of discussion of these higher uh, rank symmetries in fractons and things like that. Uh, so I, I think, we, we will uh, witness more and more development in symmetries, which are all the basis of physics at the end. And yeah, before concluding, I have to say that, you know, all the work that you, you saw basically in, uh, in these uh, lectures and all the work in general that refers to, to my publications uh, contributed a lot from, you know, the help of all these people uh, that are all my collaborators around in these topics. And I want to, before concluding, also thanks again, the organizer. It's always uh, a very nice event. And especially for me, it feels, uh, you know, very emotional because it was exactly my first school when I was a PhD student. So that's the, the first school on holography I went to was in Korea. Uh, I guess it was almost 2012, maybe something like that. So I look forward to come back to Korea and uh, discuss some physics and have some fun in Pohang or somewhere else. And uh, before that, I want also to, to advertise a, a little thing. So some of you may know, uh, in the fall, I will move to Shanghai. Uh, and uh, I will have the, the luck to create like a group working on these, uh, these kind of topics like uh, holography, aerodynamics, condensed matter, EFT. And I will have uh, several positions open in uh, both for PhD and postdoc. So if you're interested or you know somebody that might be interested or some good candidate, or you are just curious of visiting me to Shanghai, uh, don't hesitate to, to write to me an email or to contact me anyway. And with that, I think I'm done. And uh, I thank you so much for listening to my lectures. I hope you enjoy and you learn as much as I learned preparing them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matteo, for this very nice lecture. So it's time to, to ask some questions or comments. Here is one question. How can I see non-conservation of the, I mean, current in the holographic setup compared to how to realize such a thing yeah, shown in effective field? Very good question. So the questions goes back actually to the, these questions basically. So what is a global symmetry in the bulk? So the point here is even more extreme. So there is no associated current to this symmetry in the bulk as far as we know, right? So we know that basically if you put a local, let's say is a U1 for simplicity. So you put a local U1 in the bulk, then you know that there is a current associated to this guy. The, there is a local generator in the boundary that produces a global U1, et cetera, et cetera. So you know very well that basically this symmetry corresponds to the, basically the word identity of this uh, charge here, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we don't know, at least I don't know, what is the equivalent in this case. And my bet is that basically putting a global symmetry in the bulk corresponds somehow to have a symmetry in the boundary, which has no corresponding neutral current. So even if you have the symmetry in the bulk, there is no associated neutral current on the boundary. 
So this has to do mathematically with something which is called outer automorphisms. And uh, don't ask me in detail what it is because I'm still studying it, but the, the, this is the idea that we are currently basically working on. So we believe that actually this kind of way of doing it is exactly uh, the, the analogous of these symmetries, which are symmetries of the system, but they are not associated to any conserved current. So there's no current, it's like conserved. And, uh, and one other thing that you can ask yourself, and it was actually asked by the group of uh, Nicolis in Columbia University, is, uh, and probably you should have complained also before, is, you know, I said a lot about this effective field theory that they have these global symmetries, etc. But then what I'm doing, I'm cheating. Because in principle, if your effective field theory should live on the boundary, all the symmetries of the effective field theory here should be gauged in the bulk. But I'm not doing that. I'm not gauging the symmetry. I'm not gauging the internal shift. So one thing that Nicolis uh, emphasized in one of his paper, which I think is called conformal solids and holography, is that in principle, you should gauge the symmetry. The big problem is that those shifts are not compact and you don't know how to gauge it in flat space. So what they did is basically putting the, the things on a sphere and then take the limit of the radius of the sphere very large. And in that, in that way, what you see is that if you gauge the symmetry, of course, then you have a current. And then you go back to the situation where you have a current, which is totally conserved. And my bet is that then uh, you will see a kind of different physics. So the interpretation of the physics will be different because basically then if you see a mode here, will correspond to basically this current which is conserved. And uh, well, we are discussing with, uh, with my collaborator is this can be related to the appearance of a uh, second sound basically or not. But uh, I don't have any conclusive, uh, let's say statement. It's very early to say something. I see. So one more question. Can I interpret the non-conservation of such current as some type of anomaly? So can I- that's another, in the Yeah, that's of another good question. That's another good question. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea, but it smells like, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't know how to actually do that, but yes, in principle you could. Uh, you can imagine something like you switch on some external temperature or something like that. And these external fields produce some kind of anomaly. I have no idea. I mean, it's certainly a, a nice idea. I don't know if it might work. And I don't know anything related to this interpretation, honestly. I see. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So any other questions or comments? Okay, in fact, I have one question. You know, I guess in this holographic computation uh, has been done in ADS4, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So what is going to happen if a computer uh, computes so every uh, quasi-normal mode in ADS3? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. ADS3, uh, the, the most of computation can be simplified. So we may probably compute some Green's function analytically. Then we, we may have some chance to check that universal relations analytically, then that might be great, right? Yeah, so, so the, the, the problem there, it's the following that if you have only, so you want basically only one spatial dimension. Mm -hmm. So then clearly the distinction between transverse and longitudinal does not make any sense anymore. Oh, I see. So it's actually a good question to understand in, uh, in those dimension what that means. And it's related also to an important question, uh, which is basically, can solid exist in two dimension? Mm. And uh, so in two dimension, I mean one plus one. And uh, the question is very relevant because if you think about the, the Mermin-Wagner theorem, that says that you cannot have spontaneous symmetry breaking mm. in less than two. So for example, accordingly to the Mermin-Wagner theorem, graphene shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the question is why it exists, right? And in the, in, the, in the graphene, people believe that it's because of the flexuron that I was discussing. In, uh, in holography, yeah, you, you could certainly do that thing. My other uh, fear, if you do this in ADS-3, is that gravity is not dynamical there. It does not have any dynamical degrees of freedom. So it's true that, of course, if you consider massive gravity like these scalar things, then you have degrees of freedom, which come from these scalars. So I don't really know what to expect, honestly, mm -hmm. yeah. 
The problem is that, yeah, I don't know what you really learn in terms of, you know, one dimensional solid is a weird system. Mm. And uh, I don't know. So, you know, even from condensed matter, one dimensional things can be, you know, solved in a pretty, uh, pretty much analytically, like Lattinger models mm. or things like that. But I don't know. I mean, it's certainly a computation that you can do holographically. I don't have a good intuition of what you will get or how to interpret things. I mean, you will see for sure, you know, some kind of sound mode related to the fact that you are making uh, uh, translation, but I'm not sure because you see in, uh, you will see a sound mode independently, even if you don't break translation, I guess, because it's like a conformal fluid in one dimension. So you will see basically the longitudinal uh, sound. So I don't know if you will see, if you break translation, if you will see more. That's mm -hmm. a good question, I don't know. But in principle, yeah, it can be studied. So for example, it would be interesting to see if you see this diffusive mode. Mm -hmm. And if you can actually extrapolate some analytics uh, from that. Mm -hmm. Like in some BTZ black or, or I don't know, something like that. Hi, Matteo. Uh, I have a very naive question. So uh, does the glass or uh, your quasi-crystal have any special electronic structure? Good question. It's something actually that we're thinking recently. So uh, there are, so that's a good question. So let me let me split it into, let's start from quasi-crystals. So quasi-crystals, uh, very recently there was a paper in Nature discussing the superconductivity in quasi-crystals. So for the first time they saw basically superconductivity in quasi-crystals. And uh, one question that we, 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 we are trying to address right now with some condensed matter colleague is how to understand basically superconductivity. Because you see that the point is that you have this extra mode, right? This extra phase and mode. So what is this extra mode doing? For example, can it, does, can it do some pairing? Can it, does it destroy superconductivity? What happened? That's something quite interesting. And uh, the other very important, of course, thing is that the famous twisted bilayer graphene is a quasi-crystal because when you twist the two layers, the system is not periodic anymore. Indeed, in the twisted bilayer graphene, they have phason. They see phason. And the, the, the importance of the phason was recently um, uh, analyzed in a paper by Hector Ochoa. And uh, I don't remember, I think it's called something like phasons electron in a twisted bilayer graphene, something like that. So. The, the, in, in summary, the answer to your question is it might. It's not explored enough, I would say. It might have, because of course, these guys will, will couple to the electrons somehow. And the question how they will couple, I don't think it's totally understood at all. And for glasses, uh, there are a lot of glasses which are called metallic glasses, which are very interesting. And uh, they have some funny properties. And actually in, uh, in China, there is a lot of work on metallic glasses. So if you search metallic glasses, you will find a lot of experimental things. For example, the last time I was in Beijing, I visited some people at the uh, at UCAS that work on metallic glasses. So it's, but I don't know there if there is any specific, uh, you know, electronic weird things like, I don't know, some weird scalings or something like that. I don't know. One question that I have is related also to the fact how to really, you know, describe a glass with holography or can you somehow do something for glasses? There are some old papers by Aninos and friends, but it would be interesting to understand glasses because glasses are really poorly understood and uh, the tools are usually very poor. So usually what they do are simulations. They put like a bunch of balls and they, they do simulations. And, uh, you know, theoretically it's very hard just because of the reason that you don't even know where to start because, you know, usually if in crystal you start from phonons but in glasses, even momentum is not a well-defined number. So you don't even know how to write down things. It's quite complicated. But yes, it's definitely something that, you know, one could uh, analyze, but I don't know enough to say something, you know, deep, but there is work, especially in quasi-crystal, there is work. Okay, any further questions? Okay, good. If not, let us turn to Matteo again and uh, let 